On this week's episode of Crowdfunding Nerds, we talk about a new vision for Kickstarter, their latest updates, including pledge management and shipping and marketing services. Richard also joins us. Let's get into it. Game begin. Let, 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 let's go. We're the Alliance. <laughs> Hey, everybody, and welcome to another awesome episode of Crowdfunding Nerds. I am your host, Andrew Lowen, and I am joined, as always, by Sean, and oh my goodness, Rick is in the house. What is up, Rick? Ooh, Proof ooh, that you're on hey, this phone. Hey, hey um, well, Sean and me are wearing our nerd glasses. Where's Where's your nerd glasses at, Andrew? I'm uh, this is about the one year shy. I just nerds. turned 39. So I, I'll be, <laughs> yeah, it's, I need one more year, I think, and then I'll get those bifocals that everyone else has. Ooh, um, ooh, those are harsh, harsh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah so prove you're not robot rick first of all i am not robot rick the captcha is one two three four there you go <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's the same combination of my luggage all right uh-huh. yes well so super excited to have you back rick um uh really excited to chat about all this stuff so um but, you know, first, let's before we introduce the topic, I know that we'll have a little bumper at the beginning of this episode that introduces the topic. But um, let's talk about, like, what's what's kept you away? Well, usually it's you guys are too early. You know, this, us West Coasters in the U.S. are a little a little later on getting up as opposed to people in Ireland and Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Now, also, you know, it's uh, it's like. You know, we've, we've talked about this just like a little bit, but my suspicion is that, you know, you were with us for like, what was it, like 150 episodes almost. And then, you know, I felt like you had like a lack of confidence that you could really add value aside from your beautiful angelic voice. Um, and I, I, I just think, you know, coming back, you basically embrace the, uh, the title of the layperson slash noob that will hopefully keep the uh the brainiacs um you know rather hopefully you'll keep common sense from leaving the the brains of the operation uh and 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 the overall discussion i feel like common sense sometimes is um it's easy to forgo when you have education or whatever when you deal with this every day it's like you know i just i just think that's such a necessary piece of the puzzle and so i um you know you might be like noob with Kickstarter stuff or crowdfunding stuff because you don't deal with it every day, but you deal with other types of marketing. And, uh, but I mean, you are a I very rational you consumer. <laughs> you do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, is the reason words, why our landing pages saying... load so quickly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, you're saying you need, a, you need a dumb dumb on. <laughs> we need a noob. I like, be, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm the glorified besides, blonde without uh, the hair. <laughs> your fiance will never listen if we don't if we don't have you on yeah you so lost you lost like, a whole listener <laughs> yeah so a whole um, single one. well now that yeah. i mean now that we yeah, do you're... have you on she's guaranteed to listen to this what do you want to say to her <laughs> i love you sweetie all right oh, I'm she's sure not she responding out here uh, <laughs> she's probably sleeping okay right so um but yeah um yeah so yeah when it comes to the kickstarting part of the crowdfunding nerds and for crowdfunding and other things i'm not i'm not fully involved in that stuff so i don't i don't actually see the day-to-days of what's going on uh my work is a little more secretive and uh off off side of the uh the company <laughs> yeah so but you know like sean said the reason our websites actually load quickly is because of you <laughs> so that's kind of a big deal i mean yeah we actually yeah, especially, get emails uh, play, at a play deliverance.com please visit play deliverance.com Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Order today. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, let's talk about this. So the topic at hand, we wanted to discuss this article about a new vision for Kickstarter and um, just discuss kind of what it means for the industry as a whole and how, you know, I, I guess what we what what it says and actually what we make of it. So, um you guys want to step in and give a little bit of background on this or shall I talk more? So, so, so from the dumb, dumb perspective, what I'm hearing is uh Kickstarter wants to be the all in all they want. They want from start to finish the whole, the whole horizontal and vertical of the Kickstarter 
building process or you know crowdfunding process um which i mean that sounds great for, for, from their perspective i just don't know how great it's going to be from a publisher's perspective or or a person who's interested in crowdfunding's perspective like a, a backer um and i don't really yeah. know the details i just know they want to you know take over the world yep to me what it says is that they uh they've recognized that they have created so kickstarter is i mean they they've said it in their article they've had over $8 billion pledged on their platform. And that's a, that's like a whole ecosystem of stuff since, um, and this is, I want to say in 15 years. So um, half a million dollars a year on average is, is pledged on the Kickstarter platform. And uh, of course, you know, more of that is, has been pledged in the latter years than, than certainly the early years. But um, I think that this whole ecosystem they have this new CEO. His name is Everett Taylor. Maybe we'll get him on the podcast sometime um, when we become kind of a big deal. You know, right now we're, we're, we're you know, we have like, I don't know, a thousand listeners a week or so, um, which is, which is kind of cool. But, but um, it, Everett Taylor has come in as the CEO of Kickstarter at roughly a year into his tenure right now um, at the time of this podcast recording. And he's making some moves, making some changes and, and really kind of getting the ball rolling. Um, the, the overall, it seems like they've realized that they've created an entire ecosystem of companies that are able to kind of, uh, like a, a remora to a shark. They are able to kind of, as, uh, be, have this symbiotic relationship with Kickstarter. They are, uh, that was such an advanced analogy from like sixth grade science, um, or oceanography, but, uh, they, have pledge managers that have been built to support backers and what creators uh, have, what you know, to do what creators have always wanted to do things like charge shipping after the campaign to sell products after the campaign in in a pledge manager before products have delivered. Um, they've they've got entire fulfillment houses that have made a a big deal of of the fact that they can fulfill Kickstarter projects and other companies that deal with you know European Union and um, marketing of course you know that's that's where we specialize and um other things like that and for many years kickstarter has uh we'll say not done a whole lot for uh to benefit the creators and that is i mean they are now they now are so they uh their tagline is um you know, 15 years in, we're sharing news, a new strategic vision and previewing new products to support creators and backers. And they, um, you know, I really, I really feel like, uh, what Sean, what is it? What, what did they say? Like 15 years of innovation? Yeah. Well, I, I think in their video, they sort of insinuate that there's like, oh, 15 years of, you know, crowdfunding, 15 years of innovation when it really kind of feels more like 14 years of sitting on their hands and one year of innovation. <laughs> but yeah. I think this really, this brings the, the point up that competition is healthy. And I, I think if BackerKit and GameFound hadn't come on the scene and really sort of taken up a large of their, large section of their market share, I don't think Kickstarter would have changed. I think it would have just, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But when they saw- would be on blockchain right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. For those that don't know, the uh, former CEO is the kind of one of, the, I think he was the founder of Kickstarter- um, he was, from what it sounds like, he was kind of uh, kicked out. Um, I don't, I don't know that for certain, but I can say that he uh, decided to pursue a different path, and they brought in this the CEO Everett Taylor. Um, Kickstarter, it seemed, was a very kind of an idealistic company uh, right from the beginning. Obviously, bringing creative ideas to life, you have to be a little bit of an ideologue to, you know, for that to uh, to to make that happen. But they really. Uh, kind of got a bunch of steam and a bunch of momentum and then ceased supporting the people that really supported them, which were the creators. The board game industry, uh, really the board game niche on Kickstarter makes up almost uh, 40% of their funding uh, year to year, like the largest market by far, but had very, very little that, you know, very little support um, overall. And, you know, for, for many of those years and, uh, and I feel like it's yeah, kind of that, underrepresented on the side. If you go to the front page, they're usually promoting some, you know, RT project or some design project. You very seldomly will see a, a board game you know, featured and, you know, like, or like a dedicated article on it or something. So as you yeah. said, 
even though it, it takes it is a lot. I think they kind of want to move away from Kickstarter being for nerds. <laughs> they want to make it oh, it's for like cool, you know, hip Audi types <laughs> rather than right. It's for a bunch of yeah. geeks. <laughs> yeah. So you know they they I, do I have just a to go significant. Where the money's at. <laughs> well, you know, if they, I feel like they definitely are looking to balance more than um, lean in because if they did, they would be dominant. You know, they'd have like sixty percent of their revenue generated from board games. GameFound wouldn't exist, and and Backerkit would still be a pledge management system, right? And um, I think that was at the time kind of contrary to their goals of um, pushing, uh, you know, certain projects and other things like that. So they wanted to do a lot of like small projects that were, you know, hundred dollar stretch or hundred dollar funding goals, and uh, just to kind of encourage people to to get stuff done and to make uh, just in general you know, bring creative ideas to life, create creative ideas and whatnot. And so a lot of their, you know, um, what they wanted to push was not actually what made them the bulk of their money. Um, so there are, um, you know, other, there are like lots of like board game RPG type tabletop related projects, but I, I feel like overall you're right, Sean, that they, they do even today still kind of push um, other things for visibility and and i think i actually think that's okay because i will say that um you know board games uh the re i mean it's it's so big not because of kickstarter itself and anything special that kickstarter has done with you know per se but it it's the only way that an independent board game company or tabletop company can actually bring a, a board game to life that is indie um without having to you know, rely on a publisher to come up with the funds to make it. And um, so that's, you know, just it's basically fulfills what the Steam store fulfills for video games, where indie creators can actually uh, create a game and get it out there to, um, uh, you know, a mass, a massive audience and get and raise money and make a full time living for themselves doing that. Um, you know, that's why actually I think Steam is the single reason that the Kickstarter video game market is so small. Board games do 40%, or it was like 38 the last time I looked, of the uh, total amount raised on Kickstarter, whereas video games do like 8 or 9%. And we know that video games overall is, are, are just a much larger market. It's just that you, you know, the independent creators don't need to drive people to Kickstarter to create games where they actually generally... Um, will raise uh, you know a little bit of capital on Kickstarter and announce the project, and it's almost more of like a marketing thing to get you know like Hollow Knight did this. We've done this with a number of our video game clients where they generate you know fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and then they go to Steam and they raise you know a million dollars or 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 ten, um, just because the audience is so much larger. But what's nice is that you know on Kickstarter, I remember Sandwalkers we had. Um, was a project that we did. We we had um, like fifty or so thousand euro that the the project did, but it received at the same time ninety five thousand wish lists uh, during their kickstart, like the thirty day Kickstarter, and you know that translated you know as far as uh, wish lists to backers and whatnot was is a significant, very significant amount of money. Um, so anyway, that's I do think that board game kickstarters generally bring their own audiences and that's something that kickstarter relies on very heavily at this point um you know their organic traffic is so strong in the board game space because board game creators are constantly bringing their audiences by you know you know every little creator and every big creator that uses kickstarter has an email list and they are like hey we're live on kickstarter now here's a link to our kickstarter and then you have tons of fans of all of these companies going there on a regular basis. And so um, now, of course, GameFound is, uh, you know, e you know uh, taking a significant chunk out of Kickstarter's revenue. Um, they're, I think they did 50 million last year. They're on track for like 109 million this year is what their goal was maybe or something like that. But um, yeah, that's a significant chunk out of Kickstarter's um, revenue. And so I, anyway, I just think... Uh, Kickstarter, they they were caught unaware, or rather, they were caught resting on their laurels and not actually, um, not 
innovate and not continuing to innovate, not continuing to just simply listen to their, their primary audience, which were creators that are bringing people and bringing projects. And that kind of opened the door for a company like GameFound uh, and a very smart, very uh, in tune with Kickstarter company, Awaken Realms, uh, to, to make a real go of um, making a competitor or a comp making a competition. And then backer kit, of course, jumping on board. There are others as well that have kind of jumped on board too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear what you guys make of uh, just that, I don't know, Kickstarter's history and what, and why they open them, how they open themselves up to like getting, um, all of this competition. And, and then we can talk about what they're doing, um, in response. I'd like to say I was all good until you started talking about Steam. Um, I I feel that Steam has become the Kickstarter of video games now, um, especially now since <laughs> almost every game that comes out is pre-order and you pay full price to beta test their product for them. Um, yep. And of yeah, course, they build their, that's how they build their and then they build their community while they're doing that. And once they get enough money, they launch it. Um, yep. Now, I know um, in the past, Kickstarter, um, with their statistics, I think they said that around 30 ish to 40 ish percent um, of sales are attributed to the Kickstarter brand itself is, do you think that's still true or if they've changed if they got up or down is Kickstarter still that main, you know, are people going to Kickstarter first and looking for games or are they finding games and going to Kickstarter? You know, I, I would say that it's, it, I remember the very first episode that we ever did was kind of on Kickstarter's referral metrics. And our conclusion was like what you said, it was roughly, if you bring six people, then Kickstarter as a platform will bring four more. And I think that was in 2019 when we said that, um, maybe the end of 2019 or something. And uh, I remember it was like right after Sean came on board and whatnot, we we talked about that. And then now I, it's definitely less. Um, I would say if you bring eight people, Kickstarter will bring two more. So Kickstarter is a very significant piece of, of organic marketing where you still get 20% of your audience coming from Kickstarter, but it's not quite as, uh, as large as it, as it was before. Um, would, and I, you know, you, there are some projects that would be higher probably. Weren't you quite surprised by how many folks from your deliverance audience came organically through Kickstarter? Yeah. So that, uh, in 2021, when we launched our first deliverance, uh, you know, we had, we did, we had 2,700 backers and then. When, uh, so I, I did, uh, like a month after that, I, I put out a survey that asked, how did you find deliverance? And it was a, the largest piece of the pie was about 22% of people found us through the Kickstarter platform. And that was very surprising. You know, we had, uh, about 20% of people find us through Facebook ads and, or just Facebook. And then, um, you know, it went, it kind of scaled on down. We had board, you know, uh, board game geek had a significant chunk review videos had a significant chunk, but those types of things were anywhere from like maybe 10% of the pie each, whereas Facebook ads was about 20%. And then, um, the, uh, you know, and then Kickstarter was, um, like 22. So I would say I would, I would guess, and we did not earn the project quote unquote project we love. However, we did reach uh one of the um the hottest projects on kickstarter at the time um so we had we didn't have project we love but we were constantly ranking like between four to six on the tabletop category and uh, overall as well and we were competing against the witcher old world which was one of the biggest crowdfunding projects of all time uh in a kind of a similar niche as ours for a couple of weeks so they were always ahead of us or or we, i think we went ahead like our first two days um, but yeah, so I would definitely say it made a significant impact. And when I, I recall w during our Kickstarter campaign, um, something weird happened to us where, uh, we were ranking in the top 10 games and we were making $10,000 a day after our first 48 hours. So we raised roughly $140,000 on day one. I want to say another 60,000 ish, maybe on day two, I could, I could be misremembering um maybe another forty thousand in day two and then like 10k a day for the next couple of days and all of a sudden it went from like ten thousand a day to like we had a day where we did four thousand and then the next day was two thousand and it stuck at two thousand and i wondered what 
You know, I thought maybe that's normal. You know, that's kind of a normal mid campaign thing, but it seemed like um, anybody that had backed our game, you know, you can't really find it on the search uh, because you've already backed it. But then people who haven't yet backed the game, I asked them to search and we were rate, we were ranking in like, we were ranked position 252 out of 258 projects and we're still making 2000 a day. So something happened where our organic momentum was entirely killed and, um, the, you know, other weird stuff happened, but, um, we were organically generating $2,000 a day, roughly from just word of mouth. And it would be spikes up, you know, like we got dice tower crowd surfing project of the week and whatnot. Um, and Tom's pick of the week. And, and so we had like six or $8,000 earned that day. And we would do a big update where we'd give people something exciting and a lot of people would upgrade to the all in pledge. And so we'd have a spike that day, but in general, I saw a significant uptick when we were in the top 10 of Kickstarter. And so that doesn't surprise me at all that a lot of people found us. I really would be nice to earn project we love. And because it seems like project we love those projects always get set above the other ones. It's almost like, it's almost like it's like a Google paid ad. Um, whereas I, as a backer, I don't really trust Project We Love a whole lot because it doesn't mean anything other than somebody at Kickstarter liked it and pressed a button. Um, and so a lot of the time I'll look at those, but I will purposefully scroll past and look at what's very popular, just naturally very popular. Um, a lot of the time they're one and the same. The project, you know, that Kickstarter loves is also a project that is quite popular. Um, but you know, it's uh, it was it was interesting. So anyway, long winded way of answering that question. Um, <laughs> do you- do you happen to know if um, you may not have the answer to this, but do you happen to know? Because I know once you transitioned over to your pledge manager, do you believe you were still getting leads through Kickstarter? Because I know like you can set it so it'll go to your 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 pledge page. Do you think you were mm-hmm. you got some sales because of that as well? Definitely, I would I would say on a regular basis. Uh, so we we used we went from Kickstarter to Backerkit as a pledge manager initially, and then later on we moved to Hive. Um, but uh, we. We set up our pledge manager about a month after our Kickstarter um, ended, and we sent people to our website to jump on our email list. In between that time, uh, there's this button that's like above the fold on Kickstarter. You can send it wherever you want after your project is done, and um, you, the call to action can generally be what whatever you want. And uh, so we had people just subscribing to our email list afterward. People like two hours after our campaign ended, they were like, just discovered this. How can I get this? You know? And so when we switched it over to um, Backerkit, the link to Backerkit when our pledge manager went live, I would say we made like one sale every day from somebody going to Kickstarter, uh, just entirely organically, sometimes more, sometimes not, you know, no sales, sometimes five sales. Um, And it was generally because when people look for deliverance, the first thing, you know, deliverance board game, first thing that popped up was Kickstarter. They clicked that because Kickstarter is a very large site with a very high domain authority. And so it's going to rank really high on the search engines. And um, so I think that anybody... We we never spoke about that before, but yeah, there's a point to that where running a Kickstarter in terms of your business long-term helps with your SEO. Because as you said, it it has you rank very high with it. So it kind of is a way to kind of grab some of those top spaces of search terms around your game. Kickstarter is up. Uh, yeah, Kickstarter is a high authority domain. Hey, now we're talking about my stuff. All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kick, what Kickstarter does that even is a high mean authority right? domain. For, our, for our listeners? So, yeah, Kickstarter is a high authority domain. It's trusted by Google. A lot of people go through it. So, um, it's you know, when links come from that site, they bear weight. So, when you link from Kickstarter to wherever you're going, that's going to also increase um, your authority of whatever page you, you link it to. So, if you're linking it to your, you know, to like Tobacco Kid or Hive, um, that'll build authority for that page that you link it to. And of course, that's why you want to make sure when you have those pages set up um, that you also be very descriptive in your game, just in case, you know, someone comes from somewhere else and doesn't know what your game really is. So you still want to mm-hmm. be able to say, you know, this is a, a, uh, a five, five, uh, five E uh, dungeon board crawling game with zombies and whatnot, or however you want to say it. You want to be very descriptive. So that way, when people are looking for those things, like, Hey, I want an apocalypse game. I want a zombie game. Um, you know, that page will yep. rank very well because it's getting, getting more authority. Um, and you've actually yep. used it as a descriptor in your page or your, your, your backer. Yeah. And, and, uh, page. 
actually, I gave I gave this advice uh, recently. We had a podcast project that we took to Kickstarter. Um, Sean's favorite. It was called The Exorcist Files, and it um, <laughs> that's tongue in cheek as a joke that we won't explain on this podcast probably. <laughs> but um, so the uh, the project itself, they raised about a close to two hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter, and at the end they were like, "Hey, what should we do?" You know, for our final. 24 hours, 48 hours. And I told them, you want to make sure that above the fold before the campaign ends, right at the very top, you have a thank you. And here's where you go to download, you know, stuff. And, or here's, here's where you go to, to do things. And um, then also, of course, you want to be able to direct them uh, with a link somewhere. Uh, You know, once the Kickstarter campaign ends, you cannot adjust your page anymore. It's there pretty much, you know, archived forever and uh but you do have a link that is that you can actively change so i looked actually i looked at the home page for kickstarter.com the domain rating is a 92 out of 100 so 100 point scale would be uh like google.com tiktok um you know those you know microsoft.com maybe those are like 99 to 100 you know the biggest sites on the internet and then every domain rating point you go down, there are, you know, the sites get smaller or less trafficked and that kind of thing. So because uh, I want to say Kickstarter has, you know, roughly, I mean, I guess it's it's saying one and a half million uh, people that traffic the site organically um, a month, I, you know, and, and a bunch more that traffic from, you know, other, other places, uh, you know, so you, you've just got a ton of organic traffic going to Kickstarter. Um any any place that Kickstarter links to is going to get a huge boost in their their the trust that Google has for for that website. So it's kind of like when Kickstarter votes for you, Rick, you can clarify for me if if this doesn't make sense to the audience or to you. But it, it's like a vote of confidence. Kickstarter linking to your website is a vote of confidence in Google's mind for your website, and therefore Google will take whatever your website has to say on it more seriously. And then in addition to that, of course, Kickstarter being a, um, you know, like uh, I circling back to this podcast, I told them, make sure you've got like uh, keywords in a major title somewhere close to the top of the fold, like um, uh, the number one exorcist, you know, Catholic podcast on the internet or whatever. Um, (laughs) That way, when people are searching for Catholic podcast, that Kickstarter uh, is actually really going to probably show and it's going to add a lot of authority to your website um, for that particular phrase. And, and then what so about, I know, what you, I know Richard, you, you talked about um, the page and make sure things are clearly laid out, but on Kickstarter pages, they're sort of known for having lots of images. How important is old text? Should you in- include a short description does it matter or should you basically put as much text in there to describe the image as possible what's sort of the strategy around alt text and images so text stuffing is is not advised anymore um you pretty much the guidelines that google wants is you want to make sure you're actually describing the photo so you don't want to do keyword stuffing in there unless unless the keyword is part of describing the photo but like for example let's say you have a picture and it shows like someone moving a piece on the board game. You would say something like, you know, like um, uh, pl- player uh, placing their hand on the board game and, and moving their piece or something like that. Um, alt text, um, you can. It's 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 hit or miss really with the with keywords. I don't re- really recommend keyword stuffing at all. Um, I like I said, I, I would play it by Google's rules and just say what it is. That helps. The most important thing, though, also, besides having a link to the page that you're advertising, is to have unique photos and to have unique content. If you're using stock photos, it's not going to help you at all. You need to make sure that the photos you use or the artwork you use is 100% genuine and original. And also, um, maybe, you know, a little note about AI. I, I would wager to say that there are, there's, you know, in, in the way that Google indexes, they can see what is generated by AI and what is not. Would you, would Correct. you say Google so? Knows what, yes, Google knows what's AI or not. At this point, though, they're not really, they don't really care as long as the person has gets the experience they want. So if the person searches for widgets, they go to the page, they find the information they want, 
widgets um, and it's successful, then that's a win and Google's okay with that, even if it's AI content. The um, the the issue that's a lot of people are getting um, de-indexed for lately or what they call a manual a manual penalty is that they're just rehashing the same content over and over just to display ads. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a lot of sites these last few months have been dropped because all they're doing is rehashing the same content. That's why I was saying your content needs to be unique. It, I know a lot, a lot of us aren't really good writers. We're not good copywriters. We don't do well. I do horrible. I use, I use, I use AI a lot to, to try, try to, uh, I have ADD. So that's why, you know, my talking is fast and I'm all over the place, but I, I use it a lot to be able to actually try this. to vocalize to, to, to others, <laughs> um, what I'm trying to think and convey it in a more uh, way that people would understand and sounds good as opposed to coming out of my head. It's just blah. So uh-huh. AI is fine as long as you're not just rehashing some other stuff on the internet. And that's a concern because a lot, that's another reason why Google's de-indexing a lot of these, these sites and pages is because all of a sudden now everyone's making copies of copies. So everything on the internet is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And now of course there's always things where people like make like it's not true or something and it gets copied. And then all of a sudden it's like playing the old school telephone game where you tell, tell someone something and they whisper to the next person, next person. And the person at the end has no idea what the first person said because it's all been jumbled. So very important to have that unique content. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't matter at this time if it's, if it's art, art, Google can tell the difference between artificial and not, but they don't, they don't care as long as you are giving the, the visitor what they want and providing a unique experience. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, so one know. thing we've talked, we've spoken about in terms of Kickstarter is that competition is good, right? So because these these competitions, uh, these competitors have popped up, it's forced Kickstarter to innovate. But now let's yeah. maybe change gears to talk about why centralization is bad, because I kind of feel this direction that Kickstarter is going, it might be good in that it forces GameFound and BackerKit to innovate in in other ways. Mm -hmm. But I I feel like this philosophy of trying to do everything is not going to work. We've seen Facebook do this. We've seen YouTube do this. We've seen a a bunch of other big tech companies try and, you know, copy their competitors and specialize in things that they don't specialize in. And they they always fail. Maybe the most famous being Microsoft turning into live streaming. I think I can't even remember the streaming service they had. They tried to compete with Twitch and it just, it just failed on its face. Uh, even YouTube Gaming, which is like a streaming service, has not really worked out in, in terms of shutting Twitch down or taking a local market mm-hmm. share there. So let's maybe talk about the dangers of centralization because I, I hate centralization. Yeah. I hate centralized religion, centralized finance, centralized communication. It's, it's all bad. <laughs> I should hope be decentralized as much as possible. Yeah. But well, you live in a centralized I, I'll, I'll time say... zone. <laughs> no! yeah. so, we all evolve yeah, around you your must... time zone <laughs> <laughs> so i um i'll say that each um so if you notice the way that kickstarter game found and backer kit we'll, we'll call them like the big three um kickstarter is ahead of game found game found is you know about super far ahead of backer kit you know um but th- those are the three big players that are actually getting good projects that are getting you know getting interest from from fans so in the end i i will say i do think that competition the the people that it's absolute best for are the um the consumers of products so i do think that innovation is causing people to um you know to just get creative and 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 do interesting things um it also has some negatives i do think it's a little harder to stand out when the organic audience is fractured you've got some people who mainly check backer kit some people who mainly check game found others who mainly check kickstarter and so they they might miss more commonly you know what is going on there um at the same time it's easier to stand out on each of those platforms because of you know there are uh, fewer projects um you know on each individual platform even though there are overall greater numbers of projects over you know um as as a general um observance and uh, so the one thing I think is a problem is that each of these three are all trying to grow in the exact same way. So they're all trying to be a, um, a, a crowdfunding platform and a pledge manager and a marketing solution and a shipping solution. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's generally the way that they're growing. I want to say, I don't, I don't think Backerkit is trying to be a shipping solution. 
um, a game found is kind of moving that direction by handling VAT and whatnot, remitting VAT, which is which is a, a really nice thing. But um, they're all growing in the same exact way. So they're like, it's it reminds me of um, somebody on like like haggling at a market, being like, "Come here, you know, I've got food and drinks and and whatever, you know." And if you go get lunch at one place, you know, if you get Mexican food at one place, you can't get Chinese food at another, right? It's like, well, you you're gonna get lunch, and I only have so much room in my stomach, and you know, maybe I can come back for dinner, uh, you know, and and visit a, a different place. But Kickstarter, GameFound, and Backerkit are all saying, which one of us will you choose? And it's it's like, um, you know, like you're the bachelor and there are three different candidates left. Which one will you give like a heart, you know, necklace or whatever that, that or a rose? Which one are you going to give a rose? Um, I don't know if I'm getting this right, but if I am getting it perfectly, like I don't watch The Bachelor, but, um, you know, <laughs> so anyway. That's, I think, a general problem because you can't be great at everything. And all three of these companies, some of them might actually end up being quite bad at certain elements. And I I feel like just in general, when you're really, really good at something, you should um, make sure that you are the best at that thing. And Kickstarter did that for a very long time. And then, of course, rested on their laurels. So new competition entered with GameFound and, and then BackerKit. Um, because there was a space that, you know, the creators weren't being served and all, but, um, it just feels a little like it's going to get really messy and I don't, I don't like how they're all, and I've said this before on our podcast, like they're all trying to do marketing. They're all, tr- and, and really what they're doing is they're, no, no, they're doing performance marketing. <laughs> oh, performance marketing. Yes. So <laughs> buzzword. Um, so yeah. And really what that, that means me, is they're I... partnering up with a third party company. <laughs> that is doing performance marketing for them. So when you sign up with Kickstarter, you're really signing up with Kickstarter. And if they're doing your marketing, Jellop's actually doing your marketing. And yeah, I think it's performance like as well because their their pricing structure is based on performance. So they're right. charging you per backer that they acquire. Yeah. And yeah, so that's, that's or per backer why that they, they think it. they probably acquired. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> <that's no problem. laughs> we'll just add like 30% to the number. Yeah, yeah. Let's tell you your return on ad spend, but not include our fee. Um, you know, so anyway, don't yeah. want to, I don't want to talk trash or anything like that, but I, in general, I'd say you want to use a, um, like your own. So I'll actually, I'll back up and I'll say one, one other thing is that I do think that for a first time creator that is, that is really, really does not want to do all of the things that, that it takes in order to get, get the very best results. That type of person is probably the best candidate for like an all-in-one type service where they're like, all right, I have an idea and here it is. So Kickstarter, can you just help me? Can you just like do it? How much can you do to take off my plate? Because I don't really want to be involved that much. Um, But I do think that you're going to do better if you are educated. For example, everybody listening to this podcast, hopefully you all believe that, that we as a marketing team are decent at what it is that we do. And because we're so specialized in it, we're, we're in general, it's, it's, it's a good bet that we'll do better than, than, um, the generalist the generalist too. Right. And so in the same way, I think Kickstarter has a really excellent crowdfunding platform. I would say if I ranked them, Kickstarter, number one, GameFound number two, and then back at kit number three. But then when you go to pledge managers, GameFound is clearly number one, in my opinion, back at kit number two, Kickstarter is like, you know, just trying to enter the space. Um, and then marketing wise, you know, game found is probably, uh, the best of the, well, mm, I don't know. I mean, backer kit and game found are probably, um, both, you know, kind of tied for their quality and Kickstarter is, uh, you know, with gel op is, is in a, in third, in my opinion, but, um, but yeah, it just, it all really like pales in comparison to hiring a good independent company. Like, for example, Hive is like I I I've shared this story before where I used Backerkit and I couldn't actually get a um a printout that worked for any of my suppliers and I had to do all sorts of all sorts of like you know messing around with my spreadsheets and I was going to lose lots and lots of money. I was going to lose like thirty thousand dollars from having to reship things and lose packages and whatever because of how that spreadsheet was organized. And um then you know I went to Hive and actually got it got organized so that 
we had a, a flawless shipping experience, you know, near flawless. And I just couldn't see Kickstarter or GameFound or Backerkit. They don't have the support system that I would need in order to make sure that it that it went smoothly. They don't have the manpower to be able mm. to work with creators like this. And so I just I feel like no matter how great the technology becomes, they're always going to suffer from the human problem. Yeah. Which is if we Scale. do everything, yeah, we just we've got the expert in, you know, I don't know, uh the expert in pledge management that only has 24 hours in a day to talk to people and so he doesn't have enough time to devote to the smaller projects and so on and so forth. So you I I do think the ecosystem of third party creators will be there. Um, but I, I have more thoughts on what it what it means in competition, but I'll stop here. And like, I think scale is, is an important thing to bring up because we see this with meta. Meta ads is it's virtually impossible to talk to a human. You're just talking to machines and AI and they kind of get to dead ends. And whilst with a smaller company, yeah, you, you, you reach out for support. You're talking to a human. You're getting a response. And I know within our, our company, we've gone to great lengths to ensure that we don't take on so many clients that we just are completely overwhelmed that we, we're not able to keep that, you know, consistent, a consistent experience in terms of communication and in dealing with our, our clients. So it's something that we, we take seriously. It's, I think that that's because we are a small company. We do limit the amount of projects we take on. Uh, we do say no a lot. To, yep. a lot of, sorry if you we're listen to, to this. We're trying to grow like, at a sustainable oh, I, I rate. You, yeah. You know, people <laughs> are like, oh, I hope crowdfunding knows to do my marketing. We, no, just... You, just so you know, we, we do filter out a lot of projects uh, for lots of reasons. One being, uh, we um, we 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 can't scale uh, to certain degrees. We um, we do are very yeah. intentional on which projects we take on and, and how we take them on and when we take them on. Uh, sometimes we can squeeze people in, but uh, like right now, I think we've got near forty accounts, forty different clients that we're actively managing. So yeah. it is. Uh, it's, it's yeah. pretty busy. <laughs> right. Yeah. For we, a small could, company. we could scale that to 60 really quick and then not do very well for at least, you know, 20 of those. And, yeah. um, but we, you know, we could make some money. It's just a matter of, you know, I, I actually think you can grow yourself out of business. Um, mm -hmm. where you grow, you get a bad reputation. And in my opinion, reputation is everything. Our reputation is, um, you know, on Facebook or whatever, when people ask for a marketing company, you have generally people that, that, that advocate for us are, are very positive about the experience that they had. And that's, that's really important. Whereas, um, you know, when it's like, Hey, I'll take anybody and everybody we will use AI to generate your images and we'll just go and whatever gets the highest click through rate is going to be the ad that you run. And I don't know how many sales that makes, but you know, we're going to spend a thousand bucks a day on, on ads because this one has a high click through rates. So the one that's, you know, I don't know. It just, it just feels like there's so many opportunities to go wrong there. Um, or, you know, anyway, so I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's to scale at a stable rate is really important to us. And I think uh, to, a, to a corporation, they use technology to scale fast and to, to, to reach scale with technology so that you don't have to, you know, have that human element. You know, Kickstarter, I want to say, has like 150 employees. It's not actually that large of a company when you consider, when all things considered. I mean, um, you know, $8 billion pledged, which means $800 million in revenue for Kickstarter. Um, if you split that over 15 years, fit about $50 million in revenue a year, 50, 60 million dollars, something like that. Um, that's with 150 employees, uh, per year. That's, that's actually pretty high revenue for, uh, for the number of employees that you have, I think. Um, so anyway, I, I so do there. see a few issues. Um, one of the issues is as consumers, we want the full turnkey one click solution to everything these days. And so, of course, when someone's looking at um, marketing services that only do one aspect or one product, whereas opposed to another one's like, we'll do it all. People will tend to go to the do it all, even even though, you know, they may be mediocre. It's just because it's less to them. It's they in their mind, they think it's it's less worry, less work. It's being taken care of. And I think that's the reason why all these these companies are trying to be the be all because they realize if one's the be all, then people are going to gravitate to that. So now they need the be all to catch back up with their services. Um, and like you were saying, Andrew, when you know, 
a marketing company may be really, really good at one service, but as they, if they expand too quickly, instead of having one great service or product, they're going to have like multiple mediocre services or products. And that's, that's, that's a concern as well. Like you, like someone will look at like, let's say, um, let's say, well, we'll just use, let's just use marketing as an example. Someone wants to market their business online or mark their uh, crowdfunding online. So they're looking at a single marketing company and the prices are, are, are higher than, and then what they've seen for other things, like it's slightly higher. And then they look at the turnkey, uh, like the all in one where they cover everything and they're like, Oh yeah, the, the price is only a little bit more, but it covers all this. But what a lot of consumers don't realize is that the reason why the individual one is so high is because it's, it's been, it's been, um, it's a well-oiled machine. This company mm-hmm. only focuses on the one thing and they do it over and over and over again. And they, they, you know, they, they, they constantly correct, make changes and make their product and service better every single time. Whereas this, mm-hmm. you know, full, full service turnkey is like, okay, we'll throw them through the line. Okay. They pass this section. Let's move them to the next module. It's, and I, I feel like it's just, you know, being stretched like that, it's just going to be very mediocre. the the third The third right. issue I see um, is it's like a it's like it's like a like a road or a chain where if something somewhere along the process breaks, the whole thing may break. So, you know, like mm-hmm. for example, um, a lot of companies use Amazon AWS for their web services. <laughs> well, occasionally AWS does go down. And when it does, it's like half the internet's gone because everyone's relying on this one product for everything. Same thing with Cloudflare. Mm-hmm. Cloudflare is a CDN network distribution, mm-hmm. and occasionally there's networks on their on their network nodes on their network that go down, and all of a sudden a quarter of the internet's gone. You know, and so when you rely on an entire one one company for the entire thing, if something somewhere goes wrong, it doesn't have to be what you know they're working on yours. It may affect your project, so that's that'd yep. be like the third third concern I'd I'd say where you have something that goes you know all the way through the line. However, like I said, from a consumer perspective, that looks great because all I'm like, hey, why am I paying three, four, or five companies, and I'm paying more when I can bundle and save and just do mm-hmm. one company, one price, and get it done. Right. Yeah, and um, and sometimes that is is good, like within areas of expertise. So like, for example, our company, we, our core competencies are, we build landing pages, we do SEO marketing. I mean, we, we, we can do websites and everything, but, uh, you know, we, our bandwidth is limited, right. For website design. Um, but, uh, because we really only have one guy that specializes in development, uh, right, Alex. But, um, so, uh, so we like landing pages, SEO marketing, Paid ads on Facebook and Board Game Geek and uh, places like that, Google. and email marketing. And we want people to use us for email marketing and Facebook ads and and other things like that. But each of those are are within the silo of marketing. And if you know, and and you know, for example, paying one company to do paid ads on Facebook, another company to do paid ads on um, I don't know Board Game Geek, another company to do paid ads on um, Amazon, another company to do paid ads on or whatever, and then you've got um, your email marketing, another company. That's too many people to deal with, right? So it's just, it's so much to deal with that you better be at an extreme amount of scale on, you know, for example, one common thing that I listed in there is Amazon. You better be selling, you know, thousands of games. If you're going to have one company that only manages Amazon, they have to, it has to be worthwhile. You know, if you've got one company on Amazon and you're selling, you know, 20 games a month, and one company on Facebook that's selling 20 games a month, you might as well just have one company do both because you're going to be paying fees from both companies. It's not going to be worthwhile. So, um, but yeah, so I think, um, you know, maybe like kind of coming back, like zeroing back into what, what is this Kickstarter article, this, a new vision, what is it actually saying? And like, what, what is our, our feedback? The, the biggest one to me personally, there are two, Late pledge and they're kind of related. Late pledges are now available to all creators, and that means Kickstarter has its pledge manager that manager that's working. And then, um, in addition to that, you can charge shipping after the campaign is over on Kickstarter. Those two things by themselves, I think, should have backer kit shaking in their boots. I actually think it's very scary for backer kit. Um, because BackerKit is dominantly known as a pledge manager, they are now, you know, the 
the common the common thought was like, well, should I use backer kit or game found? And it's like, well, maybe I'll just use backer kit because game found is its own thing now. And, you know, so it, it was much more common for people to want to use backer kit than, you know, than it just in my experience, people wanted to use backer kit. If they, if they crowdfunded on Kickstarter, they'd be much more likely to use a pledge manager like backer kit or, or hive or whatever. Um, then, but game found, if you, if you fund on game found, you should use generally the game found pledge manager because it's very seamless transition. It's, it works really nicely and all of that. Well, if Kickstarter has now a seamlessly, a seamless uh, transition to its pledge manager, um, I think that Backerkit no longer has an easy, uh, an easy um, insertion point into why you must use Backerkit. Um, and, you know, the only option would be to, to justify its existence as a, a crowdfunding platform. In which case, you would also be able to justify why use Backerkit as a pledge manager. Well, because I'm crowdfunding with them and it makes sense and that kind of thing. But I, c- I could really see a significant amount of um, long-term damage done to Backerkit's uh, revenue streams by this late pledge manager and the fact that you can do the most important thing, which is, well, two most important things, which is number one, upsell. Um, you know, so you you get your backers that already backed the game to now um, add, you know, the various add-ons and, or increase their pledge or whatever. If Kickstarter can do that with its pledge manager, backer kit should be scared. Also, if Kickstarter can uh, charge shipping after the campaign and maybe not take a fee off of that, um, like the other pledge managers, uh, you know, they, they don't take a fee from the shipping that you collect. That's going to also be very scary for backer kit. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah, I think backer kick will probably compete on price. So it's like, okay, well, you know, Kickstarter could do the same thing as us now, but hey, we can do it at a better price. So that might be the way that they try to kind of stand out. I think one thing we should bring up as well is the culture of these different sites. Uh, if you think, for example, just go back to maybe other sites like video sites, you have YouTube, Amazon Prime, Netflix. You know, when you go to YouTube, you're, you are probably going there to find videos that are not videos you would typically find on Netflix or Amazon Prime. So they're both video sites, they host videos, but they all have different cultures and kind of different mentalities that people go to them and they're seeking different things. So I think we're probably going to see with all these different platforms, a different culture form where people will go to GameFound to get particular types of games. Kickstarter, they will go for particular types of projects back at Git likewise. So people will go to these different sites for different reasons and there'll be like a different culture that surrounds them. So I think that's going to naturally develop over time as they sort of blur the lines of uh, being very similar. Mm -hmm. So I I do suspect that you probably will continue to see big box miniature games on GameFound with everything else kind of being, you kind of midweight games being on Kickstarter and then, you know, maybe a lot of RPGs being on on Backerkit. Maybe that's an area where they can uh, jump into and they've had a lot of success there with some role-playing games. That's a good point. I think that that is definitely specialization. It kind of comes de- back down to like, even though these people or these companies are trying to be like an all-in-one solution, they could each be an all-in-one solution for a specialized niche of the industry. And I, like you said, the culture around these games, you know, you've got um, GameFound in particular with Awaken Realms. They make some huge chonky games like Nemesis and uh, Tainted Grail that have, you know, a huge campaign, lots of minis, really beautiful components and other things like that that cost very much, uh, a lot of money. So like Chip Theory Games, for example, moved over to GameFound and ran their Elder Scrolls Betrayal of the Second Era campaign. I think that that is um, a a really great project for GameFound that was a $400 all-in and hit GameFound's audience perfectly. And I think that that campaign on Kickstarter though it may have had more visibility, let's say, I, I really don't, you know, like more organic visibility. I think that they were able to hit like dominantly all the people that really would have wanted that. I think that it was, it was fantastic. Um, so. And these kind of niche sites can exist. I, no, I was just talking to one of our former clients today and they're a French company and they said how they, you know, a couple of years ago, they had a campaign on this French crowdfunding website, which I'd never heard of before. It's called 
Yulu? 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 I don't Ulule. know. I'm not French, so I don't know how to pronounce it. But they raised 201,000 um, 201, uh, euro yeah. on the site. And it's only French speakers. It's like a French site. And it's a tabletop game, which is pretty impressive for you know, a small indie company um, only targeting French speakers. So like this can exist. You can... I think these sites can sort of narrow down, niche down, and you know you can find the crowdfunding site just for French people, the crowdfunding site just for miniature games, or the crowdfunding site just for role playing games, or whatever. We we, I, we probably will start seeing that happen over time, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of um, so I was just talking to Chris Birch of Modiphius uh, on a call like right before this, and we were just we were discussing conventions and other things. His origins is coming up, and I just wanted to seek some advice about how to run a, a good booth and whatnot. And, um, we, we, we were, we kind of got into talking about the stuff and drive through RPG was where they got their start. And it, he reminded me that that little niche site still exists. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he also worked in like a little record shop and, um, he said that like back, you know, back in the day and he said that, uh, you could pay people to go around to different towns and buy your record from the record shop. And it would only take like $5,000 you know, in payment to those people to get, and, you know, and, and, and the price of the records to get you onto the billboard top 20, because it really didn't take a whole lot of effort to get into the top 20. Now to get to the top 15, it was like 10 or $15,000. And to get to the top 10, I mean, you really, really had to have a significant amount of sales that you really couldn't pay for like that. Um, but it was kind of easy, a little easy to manipulate because the market was so niche. And I think that something like this, you know, not in a negative way, you know, about manipulation or anything, but there are these markets that are a uh, niche. I want to say game on tabletop is another one. And, um, you know, there are obviously Indiegogo, uh, GoFundMe is like the biggest crowdfunding site out there, uh, because, you know, but it's just more for nonprofit and, and like aid, you know, humanitarian aid type things, um, or, uh, you know, whatever. There are there are very powerful niche sites that do crowdfunding. There are there's um I want to say WeFunder.com or something like Revolution or whatever.com that's more like crowd investing. There's Angel Studios that does crowd investing, and the Chosen is like the largest crowdfunded project of all time. Does their own crowdfunding. Hasbro has their own website that is specific to their customers for things that they like. You know they did Hero Quest on that one. Did um, Amazon try some type of crowdfunding? thing as well at one point i they did i want to um, say yeah this was this was about maybe a year or two ago um they were doing ones where they would have a possible product and they'd list it and if they hit enough people interested in it then they would go ahead and make it um it had like a little bar chart and see where they are on their goal for funding that item and if they funded enough then they would actually make the item and put it up for sale it didn't last mm -hmm. very long i think it was only around for like six months but i remember it caught my eye and i think i talked about it at a podcast but yeah there was one mm -hmm. on amazon at one time but it was very short-lived and i haven't seen it since that's really interesting so what what else do you like from this article this a new vision for kickstarter article what else kind of stands out to you guys um <laughs> We talked about late pledges and, sh and late shipping. I suppose they, they also announced this idea of performance marketing to help reach more backers. So this is they're obviously going to tap into the, the marketing space, which I know we've, we've covered a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> calling it performance marketing, I don't it's just called digital marketing. It's kind of what it's known by, but I suppose maybe they want to stand out or emphasize the yeah, fact that it's a, little... it's a particular type of marketing that's, mm -hmm. that's designed like you don't, to... You don't pay us unless we... Uh, uh, produce results. It it actually is a little bit of a misnomer because you're 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 not paying commission unless they get results, but you are paying every penny of the advertising spend, which is going to be two hundred fifty dollars a day or more, probably. Um, mm -hmm. So regardless of if they are successful, or and not, this is so. why they also have their non compete kind of agreements that you have to exclusively sign with them because they don't right. want another marketing agency, you know, taking their share because they're their payments right. from finding leads so or getting conversions. So if they're competing with another agency, getting, you know, leads somewhere else, we're kind of cutting into their uh, profit margin. Right. Yes. So it's uh it is it is pretty interesting. Um but I mean overall it's just 
you know, I obviously I run a marketing company and I'm the worst qualified to be able to just take me at face value when I say this, but honestly, don't use one of these uh, pledge man or don't use one of these big companies for, for marketing. I just feel like you're well, not going to get the attention. Yeah. Do ask around, um, you know, just as a, you know, as a, a bit of wisdom, you should, you should look into other creators that have games or projects that are similar to yours and what marketing company did they use and what, what worked, you know, I will say, uh, you know, launch boom is probably one of those that are out there that, um, is, uh, you know, becoming kind of in, in some ways infamous for their $1, uh, pledge thing. Um, and you know, you've got to run your marketing yourself and other things like that with like helpful videos or whatever to, to guide you. But like even a system like that, I would say I much prefer to using game or backer kit or, um, Kickstarter's like intro. Yeah, I think that, that probably suits certain projects in particular, I imagine. Like yeah. I think Launch Boom is actually they have do a pretty good job of laying things out in a very organized and clear way. And I think they yeah. they've thought through everything very well. So right. I think some projects would do very well under the Launch Boom system. Right. In fact, I would even I would even go as far as to say like if you have the money, because Launch Boom's expensive uh for their systems, and so this is my qualifier is like if you have enough money and if you are intent on running your ads yourself, then I think Launch Boom is a great fit. And we're actually not a great fit if you're if you want to run the ads. Then, <laughs> uh, like, our, we we don't like it when you run the ads too because you mess stuff up that we're doing and all of that, right? So it's like, wow, well, you know, maybe it might be it might be better. You know, we've had people in uh, limited cases. We try to be as clear as we can, but in the past, we've had people that are you know, making changes as we are making changes. And it's like, wait, what happened here? You know, why is this underperforming now? Or what, why isn't the change that I made, you know, the one, the ad that's running or whatever. And, uh, you know, so I think that that's something that if you want to run ads yourself, then, you know, you spend, uh, you know, anywhere from like six to $10,000 for the, for the, for the package. And then you get to learn how to, how to run ads. Um, I, you know, I just feel like when our clients get to a position where they can, um, you know, where they have enough money and whatever to do what they want to do for the second project, oftentimes they just, they don't even want to touch the marketing. Like, like me with my first project, I was like, dude, I, I just can't, you know, I know I have expertise in marketing. Like I run a marketing company, but for my own project for deliverance, I needed somebody else to run that marketing because there are so many things to do that I couldn't be the guy run, you know, creating new ads and thinking of new ad text and things like that. So, you know, I, thankfully I have a team. Here's, here's you know, some interesting uh, research yeah. I found real quick. So, okay. So we talked about how the ads are going through, through Jill up. Um, but we haven't really talked about what they're using for pledge manager. And according to Kickstarter, they're using kick track pledge manager for their pledge manager. And it's interesting because they actually have criteria um, to, to for you to qualify. So for example, um, one of the criteria is your project has to have over 600 backers. Um, I know in some cases there are smaller projects out there on Kickstarter um, where they're also still high pri price point. Um, but of course it's a, like a, a niche or niche type of, of product. So they're not going to get over that many. Um, and that's just mm -hmm. one of the many, um, they have quite a few little uh, criteria that you have to meet before they even let you use the pledge manager. Um, so yeah. that might be interesting as well. Are you guys familiar with the pledge manager from KickTrack? So KickTrack is KickTrack is like a um I thought it was like a, a site that you would use to see what's going on on, you know, like the daily data Do, from Kickstarter. And yes. Like an al analytics um, type of site. Yeah. Yes. So is it let me is it a let me send the links I have they, here. Um Okay. They created a, yeah. a product called Pledge Manager. It's called Pledge Manager. Um, oh, got it. And PledgeManager.com is like, yes. So I believe Kickstarter. So PledgeManager.com was a company that um, I want to say was absorbed by Crowdox.com. And then Crowdox.com might have been purchased or maybe it was vice versa. And then PledgeManager.com was the one. They Kickstarter absorbed. So Kickstarter actually 
bought the staff at pledgemanager.com. And the company that runs Pledge Manager, you're right, is KickTrack, which is uh, really, uh, really cool. So, um, yeah, so I do, I do think that this, this is, to me, the biggest single element of news is that Pledge Manager was a, you know, it wasn't the best. I would say I preferred Backerkit to it when I had the opportunity to, to look at both. But it's been a long time. And the fact that it is automatically in, integrated in, um, into Kickstarter, it's going to be a really, really tough. Um, well, you know, here's the other thing a, is a tough pill to swallow for. I know yeah. we were talking about like the, you know, the, I was telling you how like people want the, the, you know, one key, um, you know, it does all, you know, everything product. And mm-hmm. another restriction for using the pledge manager is you have to use Joe up for digital marketing. So mm-hmm. if you just put your product oh, up right? and you want to do the play, the pledge manager, you have to already have done marketing with Joe before they'll let you use it. That is really interesting. I didn't realize that. I wonder apply now. I'm going to hit apply and check it out. So that's uh that's really curious. So there's yeah, Kickstarter and pledge manager, Kickstarter and gel up. Those are, those are the partnership. Um, so yeah, that's a, a very, very interesting thing. See, I think that Kickstarter and as well as game found and backer kit, it's the smartest thing in the world. It's like peanut butter and jelly, you know, for us running ads and doing email marketing, doing landing pages, that's peanut butter and jelly. They go together. Um, I feel like pledge management and, you know, running a campaign goes together like peanut butter and jelly, and they should be looking to do that. Um, I just think marketing doesn't necessarily go. It's just a different, entirely different skill set, entirely different mindset. Um, so but, sometimes but, threesomes are yeah. not the best thing. <laughs> That's great <laughs> advice. Uh, Sean, would you concur? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, any other thoughts before? Yeah, yeah. So, be monogamous with your pledge manager. Um, uh, now, I, I will say that I do think, as a last fi- kind of my final thoughts, there are going to be uh, the niche pledge managers like Hive, which do more than just pledge management, but act as like a a dashboard that, I, in my opinion you know, tabletop creators really need. Um, There will always be room for them. But I do think that companies that have built themselves up into a significant, we'll say pledge management empire are going to, um, they're going to start contracting revenue and and losing employees and other things like that. Um, So it's, it's something to be wary of and, you know, I I'd say that's a, that's a scary, a scary thing to, uh, to a, a, a select few number of companies out there that are trying to compete there. Time will tell. Yeah, I guess it will. All right, real Rick, uh, end this episode for us. And that's all the time we have for this episode of Crowdfunding Nerds. This is Real Rick, not Robo Rick, here to let you know that if you enjoyed this episode and would like to listen to our other awesome, awesome nerdy episodes visit us at crowdfundingnerds.com. And if you're interested in joining our conversation on Facebook, head over to Facebook, do a search for Crowdfunding Nerds Community, and hit the Join button. And as for that, we will continue our conversation next week. And until then, stay informed, stay monogamous, and stay nerdy.